When I was 15 years old, my parents split up and they had a divorce. This is also when I saw that your mind is so powerful because my body was in perfect shape. Like, can we please see and feel and experience what success really means? Success is more than just work. What is it that I want? Not the collective consciousness and all the pressure around you. If you always motor through, you tell your brain that that's normal. So what is there to achieve? There is nothing to achieve. Why are you spending half of your Sunday, your full Saturday, and your Tuesday evening, and your Monday morning? Why are you doing it? I think if you can't paint a picture in your mind on where you want to go, I don't think you're able to achieve it. I swam a race a hundred times before I even got to the water. Hey everyone and welcome to a new episode of Growth Essentials. Today I have invited Claudia and Claudia has been a professional athlete until she was 18 years old. Afterwards she followed a steep career journey and now is working as an executive coach. Today she is going to teach you the biggest misconception that we have about success and how you can manage your energy, identify the different roles you have in life in order for you to become the best and most successful version of yourself. So I would say, let's go. I'm Alina and this is Growth Essentials, the podcast for your best self on things you wish you learned in school. Claudia, when we go back in time and think a bit about your earliest context of life, what do, we, do you think do we need to know about that part of your life to better understand the person that you have become today, the woman that you are today? What has really shaped me, I think, from early on is that I used to uh, live the first four years of my life uh, with my uh, grandparents. Uh, also together with my parents, though. But uh, it was a bit of a, almost like a community. So uh, that has really shaped me because I think everybody knows from your grandpa and your grandma, you get unconditional love, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, that has, uh, has really shaped me in a way that, um, that I'm very fond of having uh, like warm family connections. Um, and yeah, I think another pivotal moment in my life was that has really shaped me up until today is that I uh, have been a, a professional swimmer for quite some time. So it has been a big part of my life. Yeah, and I guess uh, having uh, an older brother and a younger sister, uh, and there was this a in the second uh, in the second grade. I uh, was or asked, but they assessed me and I could skip a grade. And that has always been seen, at least by many parents, also as something really good. But I think it has really, in my early, <laughs> early uh, childhood and also in puberty, shaped me in a way that um, I always had to work sort of extra hard and success was being, you know, seen as being faster than other people. Um, at a very young age already. Uh, and I was physically the tiniest person always in high school, like in, in the class. So I always had to try extra hard to fit in. And I think those were some pivotal moments that, that if I now look back and I think about it, those are the moments that surface. And what, what do you think has this part of your life then taught you? Because you already said, right, you were super ambitious before and then you went into a very competitive sports, um, right, where, where you also always have to like perform and like really go like to your maximum cap um, um, capability, right, to, to, to be there and, and to have great results. Like what, what did that part of your life um, do with you? A lot. When you're in the midst of it, I think with so many things you don't really know. And if you then look back, you're like, oh yeah, th this is how it has formed or shaped me or what it did to me. And I was practicing, I think, 11 times a week uh, before school, after school. And I was like twice the size that I'm currently am and I just thick neck. Um, and, you know, always, you know, you didn't want to arm wrestle with me back then. But I think it has really shaped me that, you know, by not eating McDonald's, um, by, you know, I couldn't drink any alcohol in school parties uh, because I could never, you know, be allowed to have a hangover. Um, 
but to be very self-disciplined. So I think my, and I still have it today. Nobody needs to, you know, encourage me or, well, people, of, of, obviously encouragement is good, but, you know, really need to like motivate me to do my thing. Um, and I think also the level of passion that I felt back then is something that I, yeah, that I'm just so grateful for that I've experienced that feeling of when you're so passionate and that's it almost like work doesn't feel like work, right? It's just, you really get into the flow of things. When you, when you went that path and you also just said, right, especially in high school, you weren't able to drink any alcohol. So you probably quote unquote, did not have that normal teenager growing up life. Did you ever regret of not having that? Well, let me say I did compensate for it, right? So <laughs> after high school, I really felt like uh, also the moment I stopped swimming, which was around 18, um, I really felt like I also needed to explore the world. Like I, I, because I saw all these, you know, people of my age and my friends and, you know, they had such a different life. Uh, and sometimes I really envied it because it's not always easy. It's not always easy to say, okay, I'm going to go home early because I need to, you know, work out tomorrow morning at five or, um, but, uh, no, I, to be really, I, I don't regret it at all. No, 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 there's no regrets because I think it's, it's very exceptional. I think I just feel very grateful that I was able to have such a period in my life that I could do that. And why did you actually then stop? I think at 18, right? Around 18, you stopped. Yes, yes, I stopped. Well, this is, that's, it's a quite a personal story um, and, not, and not the most beautiful one. Um, but I, uh, when I was 15 years old, my parents, they split up and they had a divorce. They divorced. And it wasn't the most beautiful one out there, to be really honest. Um, it was a very, uh, very bad situation that we were that we were all in. And I noticed that how it didn't matter how many hours I practiced and how many you know trainings and competitions that I was just doing. Like every every effort that I put in didn't result in the same end result. And this is also when I saw that your mind is so powerful because my body was in like in perfect shape. Like it really was like, you know, all the years before, but my mind just wasn't right because of all the stuff that happened to me and to, you know, my family that I noticed that I was, you know, like it, it, I wasn't progressing as much as I wanted. And then the sports world is also very, very competitive and it's a bit up or out. Yeah, so to a certain extent, it's like a family, but at the same time, there's also no mercy um, because you always have to be on top of your game. And I saw that there was a bit of a decline in my results because you practice a year. You need to figure like you, you practice like a year day in, day out to get like maybe one hundredth of a second of an improvement for your personal record. Like it's crazy. Like you can't see it with your eye. Like if you would hit, you know, the wall in the swimming pool, like you it would finish, you, you would not see the difference. But this is what you put all your your effort in. Um, so I just saw like, oh, 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 like this is not going in the right direction. Then I rather say goodbye now, than just go on and on and on, and then just turning into somebody who's just not that, you know, successful anymore, but just keeps on going. That is something I just, in, in the realm of swimming, I could, I found that very difficult to live with. Yeah. So that's when I decided to stop, yeah. Would you consider this part of your life like one of the toughest moments for you personally so far? Yes. And it, and it actually has taken very long to also be, to go back into the water again. Yes, yeah. to be comfortable with being in the water again, because it brings back so many memories, the good ones, but also some of the bad ones. Um, so it's not only a, like a fairy tale story. I think I'm super grateful up where it has brought me. Um, and I now can even say, I'm also grateful for the fact that it happened all to me and that I was able to enjoy a, like a normal life, quote unquote, uh, because I had an amazing, 
you know, sort of life after, uh, after the swimming. It's like Claudia, you know, before and after. Also a bit of a different person, but uh, yeah. 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 Tell me about um, your life afterwards. Like I, I imagine it's like, I mean, all of a sudden a huge part of what you co consider yourself as, right, of your identity is suddenly taken away from you. Um, like what has happened afterwards? Like how, what was that time like? And how did you then make a decision of what, like what to do afterwards? Yeah. Yeah, it was a um, it was a, a, a period in my life where I just what, exactly what you said. Like my identity was very depending on swimming. Like I'm a professional athlete. I am, you know, Claudia, the the sportswoman, having a very rigid schedule, and then suddenly it's like, oh wow, okay, <laughs> now what? Okay, hello world. Um, so it was also like seeking boundaries, trying to figure out a bit like where do I fit in. Um, and there was also the when I also graduated from from high school. So everything sort of came together. Um, I just decided to take a gap year, um, started working. I always love to work next to it. I'm also a bit raised with, you know, you need to also work for your money and you need to find a job. And I, so I always used to work as a, as a 15 years old, like on the side. So I just continued working. And afterwards, um, you continued your working, your, your career journey, right? And that was also um, full of, um, yeah, of course, like great career moments, right? You worked at Rocket Internet, you founded your own company and still went into that, that direction of like probably working a lot and um, being very yeah. ambitious, right? And you still had that like drive to, to work and to achieve things. Um, when was the first time when you maybe thought that it's not like, like work is maybe taking too much of your life and you reconsidered maybe that definition of, of success for yourself? I think the moment where it really felt like it was taking its toll or where I felt I couldn't really combine it anymore in a sense that I always did was when I was at Rocket. I think that was the moment where I felt, oh wow, like there, like there are also more things in life that I want. Um, I wasn't the, you know, you could say the free single person without kids. I was now suddenly a mother being in a leadership position in a, in a very fast moving environment, you know, that I thought, okay, this is maybe taking a toll on me. What, what did you do afterwards? Well, I, it was a bit of a process for me because you, I was so strongly wired also that, you know, this is the sort of the bit of the traditional way to go in life and in your career, right? You just always go, you aim, you aim for higher, better, more. You go from junior to media, to senior, to team lead, to head of, to director, like you just, you just follow those steps. Um, I kind of did that all, almost like an automatic pilot and I, I think the beauty is that, uh, that um, without making it sound a cliche because I don't think you need children for it but what I do what I've really seen is that at the end of the day I seriously had less energy than I had in the morning and it made me very conscious of it but of how I spend my energy and before I had my daughter, I could go to the terrace and I just went in Berlin. We went to Helmutsplatz, we went to all the, and we went to nice restaurants and we just had wine. And then I suddenly, or, you know, and we, we, we just celebrated and it was just like, you know what, you know, let's just talk about these things and these things and these things. And then before I knew I felt recharged, I just hang out with friends or I could work out in the evening and I could recharge. But now with the young baby, you know, the baby circus starts at the end of a full working day. And I wanted to be mindful, I wanted to be present, but it was just, I just didn't have a lot of energy. So um, it's also when I decided to move on from Rocket and just also see if I could find something that had a bit more, that would fit better with that phase in my life. 
And it's not necessarily specifically towards Rocket or it could have been any employer, right? It's just at that moment in my life, I, f I felt it wasn't fully matching anymore with who I was or who I wanted to be. Um, and I wanted to do something where, yeah, I could just feel more energetic and being able to combine the things and still be successful, <laughs> but having more things in life uh, to focus on. Yeah, I absolutely feel like, right, um, success is oftentimes only something that we connect to our working life, especially when we start out maybe and we are still yeah, maybe also naive, um, so to say. How do you think should we rather think about success or how can we think about success rather than just connecting it to our working life? I just sometimes want to scream it off a stage where I'm just like, can we all please open our eyes? Like, can we please see and feel and experience, you know, what success really means? Um, because if you, um, if you, you know, look at the most sometimes successful people, let's, let's take uh, founders who have, you know, who build unicorns, right? So in terms of valuation are super successful or think about serial entrepreneurs or think about people in a very high leadership position within, you know, well-known brands. Um, having also worked with some of those types of people, it really has opened my eyes where I see that the people who feel successful they have differed their uh, opinion on success in a way that they see that success is more than just work. And it sounds super cliche, but the, the people who are able to give all the different roles that they have in their life, a conscious amount of energy and attention doesn't have to be equally spread, but the people who are able to do that, those are the people that are the most successful or feel the most successful. And you can also change successful for being fulfilled in life. Because I think as a person, same as with you, same as with me, same as with people who are listening, you have so many different roles in life. Your identity is much more than only work. Like I am Claudia, I am a person myself. I am a partner to my husband. I'm a mother to my two daughters. I am a business owner. I am a friend to uh, some close people around me. I'm a daughter to my parents. I'm a granddaughter. <laughs> like I have all these different roles. And with every phase in life, you can kind of give those roles a certain amount of attention. And sometimes your identity expands because you are, you know, life gives you a new role. Um, sometimes some roles are maybe, you know, taken away. Nevertheless, being able to distribute your energy on those different aspects, I think is such a smart thing to do. Um, because the number of people also that I've coached who say, you know, I sometimes feel a bit disconnected. I feel disconnected from my kids, but I'm super successful at work but it just tears me apart from the inside because I've never been home working 80 or 100 hour work weeks. Are you that successful? That's the question, right? Um, how, how can we, so like imagine a person, right? That's, that's starting out, that's ambitious, that's young. How can we define success for ourselves? Like, Give me some, like, maybe also like a concrete exercise that we can do with ourselves to, to figure out for ourselves, what does success mean to me? That is different for everybody. So what success for you is different, what it means to me. So I think already knowing that it's something very authentic, something that fits you. Uh, it doesn't mean that because there might be some swimmers out there who are fully okay with practicing twice a week and they've, that's to success to them. And maybe some of them are listening and they think, you know what, actually I should be you know, practicing 20 times a week. So I think taking off first, like shifting the focus to yourself, like really shifting what, it is, what is it that I want? Not the collective consciousness and all the pressure around you, like, but what 
what do I want? And then write down for yourself, first of all, raise some awareness on what are the different roles that I have in my, as part of my identity. That is step number one. So just writing down and thinking about what are all the different aspects that I have as part of my identity. And then for yourself, very easy, easily, but just thinking, what does success mean? Like if I, for example, want to be successful as a mother, what that means to me is that I am present when I'm with my kids and not on my phone and not all, you know, organizing all other stuff, but I'm just more present than not. It also means that I'm there with the most important moments in their lives. Yeah, I can't be there everywhere because I also have other aspects, but with the most important things. Um, and I think this is what you can do for yourself and just think about success for these different roles. What what can we do to maybe also more yeah, reflect or figure out how our energy is currently spread? Right, because sometimes I think we do things very subconsciously, right, and we don't really know where yeah. all of our time goes. So, is there anything that comes to your mind that we can do about that? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. This is a, a second part. Of what you can do once you have also all your roles, you can then plot them, like let's say in a pie chart, and you can think for yourself, okay, and then do it intuitively not too rationally but intuitively you just draw like a, a circle and then you're gonna as a pie chart you're gonna divide your current situation how you spend your energy and maybe it and it doesn't mean that a 40 hour work week you know means um you know that it's a small percentage or like a let's say half of the time that you spend or whatever but for some people if they're very occupied by work Or if it's very stressful, it's sometimes even 90% of the energy that they spend on the work. So you have to really open your mind up to, it's not time related, it's energy related. That is something completely different. Um, but think for yourself how you currently spend your energy on those different roles in life. And then what I often see is that people forget about themselves as a role. Huh? So self-care is out of the window. Um, but then think about how do you want to spend it? How do you wish to spend it? What feels okay? Do you want your work to... That you spend, let's say, 30% of your energy on work? Or do you maybe want it to be a bit more? Um, how about being a partner? Or if, if you're in a relationship, like how do you currently spend your energy? And how do you wish to spend it? And by becoming conscious of it already makes, will make a massive difference. Um, sometimes it's not only about the stuff you need to do, which high achievers in this world always like to ask, what do I need to do, Claudia? What do I need to do? And I, you should do less and be more, but just be conscious of, first of all, just become conscious of how you spend your energy. Um, just one follow-up question there, because you said, right, energy doesn't equal time. So, for example, let's say I'm you know, not working like 40 hours, I'm working 50 hours. Like, how do I know, how do I measure how much energy it takes up of my life? Maybe you could just clarify that one thing. Yes, of course, of course. Um, yes, so sometimes a, let's say, a, a conversation can already, you know, let's say a conversation of 15 minutes can maybe, you know, drain your energy massively, can feel like a full working day. But sometimes a full working day or a, a session of eight hours, maybe a cool workshop can feel, you know, I don't know, it just energizes you. But if you just think about for yourself, like if you have in a week, yeah, uh, you know, 100% of energy to spend, Just maybe start, maybe also calculating a little bit for yourself, like, hey, okay, you know, how, how much energy do I notice that it really costs? So if I'm, do I take my work with me at the end of the day? If I lay in bed, do I think about work all the time? If I, in the morning, you know, take a shower, like, is it a nice calm morning? Or am I already scrolling through my emails and trying to get everything sorted? 
And I think there we also need to be a bit realistic in how, how do we spend it? Because then indeed it ends up, you know, maybe being 90% of the time occupied by work or uh, your, your energy that you spend. Um, so do it a bit intuitively, but what I sometimes see that helps is if people really go a bit through their work week up until the weekend and really see how do I sort of an average week, like on what, how do I really spend it? And then not only look at your actual working hours, but just take a day, like a whole day and a whole night. There's one other question that always comes to my mind, right? Because is it even possible to reach a certain amount of success in your work when you're not completely overworking yourself? Like sometimes I'm like, I, I honestly like have that question. Um, is it possible? Yes, I think so. Yes, I, I do think it's possible. Um, I First of all, I fully understand your challenge, right? And I, I, I'm in that situation also regularly. Yeah, it's not that I that I'm super zen, having all my energy, you know, extremely well balanced. However, what I and if you then think about the sports world for a second and you then think about how we organize our business life, The people, the professional athletes know when to slow down. They do understand that you cannot win every tournament if you schedule a tournament on a weekly basis. They, they are laser focused on what they wish to achieve. Like I knew that I sucked in, you know, breaststroke, Uh, backstroke, all the stuff, right? I knew what I was really good at and I knew what I wanted to achieve in that realm. So I think making choices is very important, first of all, because we can't do it all in that sense, yeah? But also, um, I think one of the things that I've learned over the years is to become a little bit kinder to myself. And we can be our own worst critic, we don't need friends, you know, to tell bad stuff to us. We can do it all ourselves. But if you just, I just also learned that if, if I really notice that today is just not today, it's just not today because it takes me now twice or three times as much energy as if I would wait until maybe tomorrow and then I can do it in 30 minutes. But today I'm just gonna look at it. I'm gonna be annoyed, you know? Oh, do I really need to do those taxes? I'm in a super, like in, in a bad mood. No, you know what? Tomorrow morning, it's going to be a new day. I'm going to put up some music and I'm just going to make, you know, make it an enjoyable process, but just not force it when it's not, uh, you know, when it's, when the energy is not flowing. That's what I now used or learned over time to then stop. Totally agree. I think that's also, you know, that, that comes back down in, in setting like realistic um, expectations maybe and not over yeah um over stressing yourself right and things also you maybe cannot control but really focusing on like i i really liked what you said especially out of like the athlete um perspective i think someone else already told me that like really first of all like focusing right on on, on the like key specific things that you want to achieve and also knowing that there's just no way for you to win a race like every day when you don't take time to actually take care of your body and I think that's something you feel so intensely in sports right because I've never like I've never had like a career in sports you know so I just did not have that experience and I and I feel like athletes may be a lot more conscious about that that you need to take care of your body like over and over again to be successful in the end right but also your mind right and it's like you actively also schedule downtime Like you do, you uh, like uh, after a heavy tournament, you just either take, uh, I'm not saying a day off, but like you can symbolically say a day off, right? Or you just, you're, you practice in a very, you know, like a very easy training for that day. Um, and you're gonna sleep in and you're gonna, like you, you have to. And I think the beauty in sports is that you get active feedback. So you also see immediately if you underperform. And it's sometimes so difficult if you're behind your laptop and doing other things, you just don't really know. And then I think nowadays we're even more by ourselves and isolated after the pandemic. So where do you get all that feedback from? 
and you see more and more people starting their own business, eh? also like you. So you need to make sure that you also have people around you that can also tell you and give, you know, mirror back how you're doing. Um, but I do think like very practically, actively scheduling downtime, self-care moments are so underestimated, but so needed. And they make us feel so good about ourselves. Um, that can go a really long way. Um, and I think that you, the moment you take a little bit of downtime, the cool thing is that in your mind, you know what happens? Like if you do that, you tell your brain that you had a like a, a high peak moment and also if you learn to celebrate those moments that's why it's so important right your algorithm in your brain gets then formed and says oh if i work really hard or if i if i reached something then i get a treat then i you know can do something really nice for myself or then there's a bit of downtime but if you always motor through you tell your brain that that's normal so what is there to achieve there is nothing to achieve what's like a typical thing you see when you're coaching your clients how do they because you're coaching a lot of as you said like executives people that are always also working under this high pressure and have lots of things to do very long hours very long days is there like a typical routine you, you you could like people are usually taking to schedule that downtime? Like, do they do it like once a month? Do they do it like every quarter? Like how, <laughs> how are people usually like organizing it then? What I can say is that I would, if you then think about those, how you spend your energy, remember the pie chart and you think about yourself, like when are you, and you just focus on the role self, like, How much energy do you want to spend on yourself? I think that's a good, you know, and even if it's like 5%, that's fine, right? It's already like 5% more maybe than before. But I think learning to actively make like a bigger thing out of it, I think once a month is super healthy. But at the same time, also on a daily basis, it can be very beneficial. So even if it's just five minutes before you go to bed thinking about what you're grateful for, That's just a massive energy booster. Uh, or, I don't know, in the morning, maybe you like walking with your dog when the city wakes up, right? Or something like that. You can also do it in the smaller things, as long as it's just something actively and consciously that you do with the aim of taking good care of yourself. Speaking of gratitude, um, what do you think, like, what's the role, what role does gratitude play in becoming successful? I think it means the world, to be honest. Gratitude is its such a beautiful emotion. Um, it can really help you to become more mindful, to focus on the positives. And I think, therefore, it has a very strong correlation also on success. Um, and it, it ties a bit into what I just said about knowing what you do it all for, right? knowing why are you hustling, like why are you spending half of your Sunday uh, and maybe your full Saturday and on your Tuesday evening and your Monday morning, why are you doing it? And I think understanding why you do it can also help you in those moments to zoom out a little bit that you know this is just a stepping stone to get to somewhere else so you maybe don't over identify yourself with it. So I think gratitude can really help you to see how does it all play in, like into, into my life. How do you practice gratitude? I think as a, as a person myself, I think it's something that I, it's not the most easiest feeling that I, that I can experience. So it's not a, like if you look at the whole chart of emotions, I think for me personally, it's, it's quite, um, It's an emotion that I need to, you know, become more conscious of, but also train a bit because theoretically you can kind of know what it is, but to really feel, to feel grateful, to have this absolute, you know, intrinsic 
you know, that every cell in your body feels grateful for something. I, it is something that I, that I just, that I, at the moment actually, uh, also sort of train to just really stand still and think, what is it first of all that I can be grateful for? Because there are so many things, right? Like even uh, so many things, but you just forget it, right? Sometimes you have such a bit, like at the end of the day, maybe a bit of a recency bias because you just had a, let's say a difficult last meeting. And then before you know, you can end the day on a, with a feeling of, oh, it was actually quite a tough day. But if you then think about it, maybe a colleague brought you a sandwich or um, you had a super nice phone call or a, a nice WhatsApp message from a friend or you actually had a really good night's sleep. That's the stuff to be grateful for. Yeah? Or that somebody waved at you on the street and just made a nice hand gesture and said, you can, you can cross the street, right? <laughs> um, and that, that, I, that is something that I'm currently practicing to really focus more on those things. Also because I help my, the people that I coach so I need to eat my own dog food, but just to become more conscious of it. Yeah, I think it's super nice because I feel like, you know, once you start becoming like trying to become more conscious of it and writing it down maybe in the night, but it also shapes your everyday life, right? Because all of a sudden you notice these things that you didn't notice before, right? And I think it's also for me, it's always so crazy because I feel like, you know, things that you you can be grateful for they sometimes become so usual so fast right that it's like something like like something we wished we had and then we have it and then we forget it right we forget that it's so great to have and that doesn't need to does not um, need to be like a material thing it can be like a great friend a great partner everything right and to remind ourselves that this is so special to have is so beautiful in sports you also speak um, about like visualizing your success right i think it's something that you learn also very early on how do you think should we or can we use visualization to become successful? I see it almost a bit as a life hack, to be honest. I think if you can't paint a picture in your mind on where you, where you want to go, I don't think you're able to achieve it. So I, you need to know what you're striving for. And I think the visualization aspect has been two elements to it. Um, one is... What does it actually look like, right? So if you think about your life, think also holistically here, right? Don't think only work, don't think only maybe relationship, don't think like focus on like, what do you want your life to look like? And you have these very practical, you can say like vision board and vision board sessions and it be, be, becomes more and more normal to people. But what is even more important is cultivating and and, and experiencing and thinking about how you feel when you have all that. So you need to attach an emotion to it. And I think that is, that is very important to do. And indeed what you said in the sports world, you're, I swam a race a hundred times before I even got to the water. And I actively believed in it that I was win that I was gonna win, and then I also knew how I felt when I was gonna win. I was like, woohoo! Like I did it, I did it. Um, yeah. So being able to do that, knowing what it looks like, and attach your feeling to it. Um, you just already mentioned the vision boards, right? But um, do you can you recall like another exercise maybe that we can take also to attach those feelings because. Um, you know, like, how can I go about it? Like, do I write it down, for example? Um, what's a good thing to do? I really like, but that's uh, what I personally like. There are some really good meditations because I, on, on, on visualization of your life. So what I often do, I just go to YouTube and I just type in a theme of that I you know, wish to meditate for. And then you have beautiful meditations because you need to find also a voice that really fits you know, with, you know, how you take in information. So I like a very more a sort of lower masculine voice, but some people really like more like a higher feminine voice, but there are different, there are different types of meditations out there because you need to sink into your body. Like you need to start feeling and that is, it requires some time to, for yourself to get out of your head and more into your body. 
So once you've painted a picture in your mind, then I would highly recommend such a meditation to, to, to really start embodying what you wish to achieve. How does this also need to correlate with ownership and taking action then though, right? Because sometimes, I don't know, I'm just like, because sometimes I think what happens, right? People make these like vision boards and they get super excited, but then they're sitting like in front of their board and they're like, okay, like now what? <laughs> It's good that you point that out because uh, that's just the first step, right? It's all about raising consciousness, I think, on where you want to go in life. Because that already is quite a big question to think about, right? So a vision board is more, I just more see it as a, a means towards an end. It just helps you to understand where you, are, where you want to go for the next phase in life. Yeah? You don't need to make it too big. I always make it just for like a few months ahead or a year ahead maximum. And I just, you know, I start to really start believing in, in that life or, um, but I'm very practical, right? Like I, um, Yeah, then what, right? So if that's what you want to achieve, like how are you going to get there? Then a plan needs to be made. And then you need to work very meticulously or at least you need in flow, but you need to work towards it. Yes. How much do you think does our confidence um, correlate with the idea of us being successful? I think there is quite a strong correlation between the two, if I'm really honest. But I do think that it goes a bit back to how you see successful. People can say all the things to you, but the moment you believe it yourself to a certain extent that it's true, then it gets to you. So if you, for example, would say to me, uh, Claudia, I'm just making up something. Yeah, but Claudia, you look a bit overweight. Yeah, I would not believe it. I it would just, it would not hurt me because I know it's not true. If you now would say to me, ah, you're actually a bit of a, a perfectionist, yeah, for example, then I, it would already get to me a little bit more because there, I know that that can be my pitfall. And I, to a certain extent, I know that it's true, right? So then it gets to me. So I think when you, I think when you learn to, to also appreciate yourself, and to confine in yourself and to understand according to your definition of success then you feel you it's okay to feel confident yeah then it doesn't matter what the world around you says because you feel good about what the stuff that you're doing so then it becomes more your own definition that's leading rather than you know what other people might say to you and at the same time also be a bit be realistic because i think also when you put all the roles next to each other that you have it's not about being perfect in all the roles uh, it's it's much more about knowing that that's you and then you already see the tension of it because you might be like oh my god there, there are like five or six or seven different roles that i have now i understand why i get into trouble all the time and or i'm short for time or energy But then knowing like what's feasible and what do I like and what's enjoyable and what makes me still feel good and successful, quote unquote. Um, I think that's, uh, that's, I think, a very yeah, a good way to start thinking about it. Would you consider yourself successful now? Oh, good question. I could say for this phase in my life, yes. Yes, it feels still, it still feels a bit weird to say it out loud. Yeah. It starts immediately like, oh, it's not too arrogant. Like, are you really like, no. but it's the, um, but not according to the traditional form maybe, but much more to my own definition. Yes, I feel more often than not successful. Sometimes still very unsuccessful. If I feel, missed an opportunity or missed a, a de something of my child, but overall I do feel, yes, more often than not successful. No, I think that's also, um, you know, what I kind of 
also took away with me during um, our conversation is that our ideas of success will always change, right? Depending on the life yeah. phase that we're in right now. And that's also super, super important to remember, yes. right? Because right now I'm 22, like 10 years from now, it will look different again, right? Not, not even 10 years, but in two years, probably even in one year, you know, I will have my energy a bit differently distributed depending on what I need right now. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm also glad that you pointed out it really differs per phase in life. Claudia, at the end, I always have some quick fire questions for you. So I'm just going to read them and you'll give me your first thought. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Um, what's your favorite thing to do in the morning? Drinking a coffee uh, together with my husband and the kids by a mile. We don't compromise in that moment ever. What's the most recent aha moment you had? The more you value yourself, the more others value you. When you could give like one advice to, you know, to like um, 20 year olds just starting out uh, in their career, what would it be? Do not underestimate your intuition. So even if your mind tells you and you have like from a checklist point of view, something feels like the right job or feels like the right opportunity or, but your whole, but something in your system says, no, 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 no. Or it says, or your intuition says, but how about this crazy other opportunity that doesn't make any sense? <laughs> Follow your intuition because it's the a form of super intelligence that your brain just cannot meet. I love that as, as, a, as a last thought for this episode, Claudia, I enjoyed our conversation so, so much. Um, it was super, super nice. And I'm so grateful that um, you joined me here um, on the show for an, for an episode. And we finally, you know, got to talk about all the, the things about success. And no, I think it was really practical and um I'm sure that it adds a lot of value to a lot of people's lives. <laughs> I hope so. And um, yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm feeling very grateful. So this is going to be in my, uh, in my uh, gratitude journaling at the end of the day, our podcast. So thank you. It was really a pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you so much for watching this episode. I truly hope that you have enjoyed it. If you did, I linked another one right here for you to check out. I hope you'll love this one as well. And I'll see you very soon in the new and next episode.